Welcome back, boxing fans here at Combat Talk Radio. My name is Leister. I'm your host. Hopefully you had a good New Year's, and you're ready to hit the ground running with some passably good boxing events. I didn't see too many happening this weekend. There may be some that are not televised that I'm not seeing, but I didn't see too many. But I'm going to go through the ones I do see, because I do think the vast majority of these are going to be uh, well worth your time, at least if you do get a chance. And I think the most of them are on the zone that I did see. So our headline fight here, uh, it's 12 rounds of super welterweight action. The final, finally, return of Virgil Ortiz Jr. Virgil Ortiz Jr. is making his 154 debut. Um, so, you know, junior middleweight, after a very long and challenging uh, past, he had a lot of months where I think he had three fights booked and he had to back out of each and every one of them for physical issues. And I'll talk about that in here in a second, but he's fighting... Frederick Lawson, who's also making his debut at 154. So both these guys are new to the weight. They don't have any advantage in terms of experience at the weight class. As far as I can tell, this is new for both of them. So that'll at least be something to offset uh, the newishness for Virgil. And so what happened with Virgil is he had uh, rhabdomyolysis. And rhabdomyolysis is a very serious issue. What essentially is happening, and people attributed it to either steroids, PEDs, or the weight cut. And turns out, yeah, he was struggling to make 147 because he wanted to campaign at 147 because that's where all the people were. And he had been at 147 for a long time. And the truth is he needed to go to 154. He didn't want to go to 154 for whatever reason. Maybe he feels undersized for 154. He didn't look it. But the point is, is that this was a very serious thing that affected him. And so he actually passed out after one of the weigh-ins. He looked absolutely skeletal. It was terrible. And this is life-threatening. It's a life-threatening type deal. It, it, it messes with your muscles. It messes with your kidneys. It's not, it's serious. So if you ever hear of somebody suffering from it, it's a serious thing. It's no joke. So apparently he's healthy now. He was able to weigh in. He didn't have any problems, but it, it was 156. I believe he weighed in and there was an upper limit of 156. So he made that limit. So perhaps he needs to be campaigning even higher. Like he, if he's, if he just hit the upper limit on a catch weight of 154, that maybe he's just been draining way down like he probably should be at 160, similar to Errol Spence. Floyd came out and talked about Errol Spence's situation and said he really should be fighting at 160, if we're honest, not even 154, because some guys are just draining down because they're going after the divisions that have the most notable fighters in them, either that or they don't believe that they'll have the same success at the other weight class for their natural weight. And maybe Virgil Ortiz is that. We don't know. We'll see what happens here tonight. Looking at the fight, of course, Virgil Ortiz is undefeated. He was at one point in line for a title shot at WBA. That was taken away from him. He was going to fight Stankonia. That was didn't happen because of the rhabdomyolysis. And so his debut at 154, he's starting from fresh. He has to make a name. He has to make a statement fresh out of the gate. Frederick Lawson, if anybody he would be able to make a statement against, it's going to be this guy. That's not dismissing him as from skill for skill. I'm saying that from experience, experience as far as the different styles going against Virgil Ortiz has less rounds of the books, but he has more experience of a diverse set of opponents. Virgil Ortiz has been in there against a, a book, a literal book of different styles and different looks that I think is going to play in for him to be able to deal with what's coming at him. And this is going to be an interesting fight to watch for as long as it lasts anyway. Do I think there'll be a knockout? It's possible. Uh, Virgil could absolutely spark this guy out in early rounds. Now, here's the thing with Lawson. Lawson, as I watched him, he's a little bit older. But Lawson has a slight height advantage. Lawson comes out and he is a, he's got power. So don't dismiss the power that he does have. And he does have more rounds in the books. So it is possible he can cause some problems for Virgil, especially because Virgil seems like he's overlooking the guy already. He keeps talking about a Crawford fight at 154. We already know Crawford, he's holding up the 147. He is not committed to going 154. So Virgil shouldn't even be talking about that damn fight, number one. Number two, Virgil's fresh off life threatening illness. And so he shouldn't be talking about anybody else other than rebuilding his damn career because he's lost a significant portion of his prime and he needs to focus on rebuild. Don't focus on getting any top fighter right now. You're not there because even if you did get the top fighter, which I don't think you would, but even if you did, you get blasted out because your body is not used to fighting. You've been inactive for too damn long and you need to focus on getting back what you had and what you lost. First, focus on the guy in front of you. And I don't know why these fighters keep doing that where they're overlooking the opponent. He says he's not, but he is because 
He shouldn't be mentioning Crawford. He shouldn't be mentioning Spence. He shouldn't mention Stankonia. He shouldn't mention anybody at 147. Crawford is at 147 because he refuses to let go of the 147 belts. That makes him a 147 fighter. So don't mention him. Talk about Patrick Tessera if you must. That's cool. Talk about anybody else that's at 154. You could talk about Jamel Charlo. Sure. You could talk about anybody at 154 because that's where you're at. And perhaps you need to be at 160. So talk about those guys. Sure. Don't be talking about guys at 147 that aren't moving up to 154 just because they're a name. That, because you are not up yet. You have been inactive. There's a chance that Lawson might catch you on something, just like we saw with Connor Ben getting taken the full distance after, you know, when he fought down in Florida and he was 100% clean. He was tested clean, and then all of a sudden he's going the distance. This is a guy that was fresh off sparking out guys in shocking fashion. Now all of a sudden he's going the distance. All I'm saying is I don't know what happened with Virgil Ortiz. I'm saying he needs to stop focusing on other guys that are not going to fight him because they're not in the weight class that he is now in. And he needs to focus forward, focus on rebuilding, get back in the ring. He needs to fight three times this year. And I'm serious. He needs to, because even if you look at his body, his body needs that. His body needs to recover. And the way you do that is to stay active. He's got to stay in the gym. He's got to stay active. If he's going to stay at 154, then focus on 154 guys. Again, I'd like to see maybe he needs to be at 160, but for right now, tiptoe into this crap and stop focusing on fucking Crawford. Undercard of the same event. This is on, all on the zone, by the way, out in Vegas. 12 rounds at super lightweight action. O'Hara Davies fighting Ismael Barroso. The story behind this fight and the reason I like it so damn much, <laughs> Barroso is the one who gave Roley all he can handle in the vacant uh, title fight where Roley got the W only because Tony Weeks stopped the fight, in my opinion, prematurely. And Tony Weeks came out after the fact and said, well, he's so old, I was worried about him. Even though Barroso wasn't taking shots, Roley was taking damage. Roley was taking bombs. Barroso was there and he was fighting everything he could. And Tony Weeks took that from him. Meanwhile, O'Hara Davies, so the story there is what was supposed to happen is Roley was supposed to defend against, defend his title. Roley reported he had an injury. The or gave him, hey, you got to show up and give me some sort of, you know, doctor's note or whatever the F on your injury. You got to give us something because we don't believe that the injury is there. And then you got to tell us when you're going to do something. And they ultimately settled that, this is basically an eliminator. So the winner of this fight, they will be the mandatory to fight Roley for his title. So if Barroso pulls it out against O'Hara Davies, which isn't as surprising as you might think, Barroso has been looking amazing. He's been looking amazing in older age <laughs> compared to younger age. He's been stellar. It's not like he's on a win streak because of Tony Weeks. But just prior to what happened with Roley, he, he got a knockout just before that. Before that, he got decisioned. Before that, he got a knockout. So it's like there's pockets of brilliance in there, like Darnell Boone. So Barroso has a chance to upset Davies, and I would consider that an upset because O'Hara Davies is a very skilled, talented fighter himself. Now, he has been stopped before. He has lost twice. And, but you know, Davies has more rounds in the books, but Barroso has more years of experience, obviously. So I would not be surprised. I'm telling you, I would not be surprised to see Barroso pull this out. And then you get Roley versus Barroso too. And then I would say, damn, no, no, no damn Tony Weeks in that ring. Cause he don't know how to ref a damn fight. Kenny Bayless announced his retirement. So he's out of here. So maybe you can get a good uh, ref, hopefully not Jack Reese or somebody, but get a good ref in there. That's going to let the action go and not just are jumping there or stop it because the guy's old. I mean, that's crap. So this I'm, I got, I'm interested in because it is possible, but also pulls it out. And then you get that rematch that I think, but also is due. Cause I don't think he got a fair shot. And I honestly think that the orgs, they saw that too. And they saw, you know, that was kind of unfair. Do I think that O'Hara Davies has a chance to upset Roley? Yes. Because O'Hara Davies, I think is skilled enough that he could give Roley some problems. Either guy would give Roley that work. I just think, but also deserves to get one more shot with a fair ref in the ring. And Roley, to be honest, Roley deserves a chance to actually get the guy out of there instead of getting a sketchy win. That wasn't his fault. It's just a sketchy ass ref. So this was a good fight for what it is. The vast majority of people think O'Hara Davies is going to blow, but also out. I, I don't see it. I don't. Maybe he does, but I don't see it because 
as good as O'Hara Davies is, I'm I straight say, but Russell's got something. He's got something that he very well could pull this out. And I think but also is going to be mentally committed to go out there and and pull this out and get that W so he can get back in there with Roley and get the title that I think was taken from him unfairly, in my personal opinion. Undercard of the same event, 10 rounds at super lightweight action. Arnold Barboza Jr. fighting Jolasani Najini. I didn't I don't know Najini. Um, he strikes me as a regional, uh, primarily regional fighter. I didn't know very much about him. Uh, but Barboza, of course, I know. Barboza, my issue with Barboza is just he's a good fighter, very solid, skilled fighter. But I think his match, his mat, the matchmaking for him is questionable. He's being matched with people that make him look good. And I think he's 30 something years old. He's got, I want to say, 30 something fights, 28 fights, 30 something years old. He's not active enough, in my opinion. And he's being matched against people that make him look good. I I wish that I wish that his career was being handled differently because I do think he could be something special if they were matching him differently. Like he needs more tests than what he's been getting. He needs to be fighting like three times a year at you know at minimum, and there are breaks in between. But and obviously the pandemic. I just think more is needed from him, and it may be too late now to do that. Where if he does step up to something, he's gonna get you know, taken out. And I, I don't want to see that from him. He's a good dude. You know, Najini, I, I don't think presents any risk to him. And that's not dinging on Najini as a fighter, but he's nowhere close to Barboza in skill. In my opinion, I don't think this is, I don't think it's going to end any other way than Najini possibly getting knocked out. And Barboza is not a knockout person. He's a boxer, but it would not surprise me to see Najini get completely knocked out in this one because Barboza is trying to turn the page for his career. I just think it's a little bit too late, and I wish he had been matched a little bit better. That's what I see on docket for our fights this weekend. Again, decently good fights, nothing that's going to move the needle, but they're decently good fights for what they are. I am going to say and talk about some of these other things that happened because I think they're important for you to be aware. So here's what here's the big news. Whole fighter of the year fiasco started to become a thing. Fighter of the year started to become a um, dominant message around social media and Crawford was out there ranting that he should be the 2023 fighter of the year because he beat Earl Spence and he unified 147. And then people started debating, well, really should it be him or should it be Inouye? Now you're Inouye or should it be Devin Haney? Because let's be honest, Devin Haney did something in my opinion, that was amazing in 2023. He was working hard. He was fighting top people and people ran stats around the number one guys that, Devin Haney fought, and it's not even close. Devin Haney was fighting top-level opposition back-to-back-to-back. He's been putting in work, putting in work. But Inouye also has wins over top number one guys as well. People talked about, you know, Crawford's win over Errol Spence. Errol Spence was not, he was not a number one. He couldn't be because, unfortunately, Crawford was avoiding the smoke for so damn long that Spence could not unify, and then Manny Pacquiao ducked that fight and went off to try to chase Cryan Garcia, so he couldn't get the chance to be a number one, unfortunately. Certain people had Spence as a top five pound for pound. As I said before, I didn't see that because pound for pound means something very specific. And Spence arguably only campaigned, I'm talking as a pro, only campaigned at the 147 mark. And at the 147 mark, although he beat the top people and he was number one at 147, I can't argue a pound for pound. When you've got guys like Inouye who are doing multiple weight class domination, when you got guys like Devin Haney, who unified the division, then defended it against the person that he unified against, and then beat that same person again, and then beat Lomachenko, like it wasn't even close in comparison. For me, I felt like Devin Haney should have been way higher on that list. I did not see Errol Spence as a top five pound for pound under any circumstances. I still felt like Canelo was a top three, so nobody was talking about that simply because Canelo wasn't as active. And people are looking at activity as well. Well, Crawford wasn't damn near that active at all. I mean, he really only has Errol Spence. He fought Errol Spence in July 2023. He hasn't fought since. He was supposed to fight Errol in a rematch in December. That didn't happen. We're not hearing anything about that one. Meanwhile, he's holding up the division. So how can you put him as fighter of the year? He comes out on social media ranting, saying he should be fighter of the year. I'm fighter of the year. I'm this, that, the other. ESPN and others come out. Now, ESPN was one of Crawford's biggest cheerleaders. But they came out, uh, the ring came out, 
others came out and for the most part, it's a wash that Naoya Inoue is your fighter of the year. And I'm talking fighter of the year, not individual fights, but fighter in terms of the totality of what they did. It's pretty much Naoya Inoue. Box Rec, I think, is the only one that had Crawford as pound for pound, but they didn't call out a fighter of the year, which are two different things. Okay, so you can argue a pound for pound as, as Crawford. I don't. I say Inoue still because when I look at the totality of what Inoue's done overall, I don't see it as close. I think Inoue just simply, his activity was so high and the level of competition that he beat was so significant because it's the lower weight classes, he had that opportunity. I think it's not even close. When we talk fighter of the year, for me, it was a toss up between Inoue and Devin Haney, depending on what it is that you preferred. If you preferred the dominance, you know, over different weight classes and different top guys, then it's clearly Inoue. But if you talk about the breath width and breath of resume it's got to be Devin Haney in just a short span of time it wasn't close there you know when let's look at Inouye's fight that for unification Tapolese I didn't rate Tapolese he'd been knocked out three times so that fight to me unfortunately Tapolese I thought was a paper champion he was a good fighter but I didn't think he was quality enough to warrant anything close to what Devin did against his wins people on NSB and other places criticized Devin Haney's win because they said that Loma Chica was quote robbed. Loma was not robbed. Loma didn't show up. He did the same damn thing he did against Tiafimo where he doesn't show up for half the damn fight and then tries to eke it out by flurrying at the end of rounds. That doesn't win you rounds. You've got to convince the judges you are clearly better than this person. It was a close fight. Devin Haney got his hand raised. I felt rightfully so. It was close. And sure, it may be worth running it back, but Devin Haney's moving up in weight class and Loma's not. So, that's in the books. Devin Haney got the W over Lomachenko. Now, if I flip that and I go back to Tiafimo versus Lomachenko, I said, to me, I had that a draw. It's cool if you had Loma winning close. It's cool if you had Tio winning close, but it was a draw. It was not this dominant nothing by Tiafimo. But NSB and other places swore that Tiafimo just absolutely dominated and decimated Lomachenko. That's not what fucking happened, period. Here, with Devin Haney against Lomachenko, I saw people talking about 9-3. No, no. Lomachenko was not dominant against Devin Haney. The problem is people don't score jabs unless it's Golovkin. So no, Devin Haney's jab was there all night long. He was making Lomachenko reset. Devin Haney was very skilled in that fight. It was a close fight. Could have gone either way, but I had it where Devin barely got his hand raised. But the point is he got his hand raised. That's the quality of that win. And then people discredit Cambosis, even though Cambosis was the undisputed champion and unified at a point. Devin Haney went overseas and beat the man twice. First to take the belts, second to defend him. I'm sorry. There's nothing that Crawford has done. There's nothing that Inoue has done that comes close to that. It's not about Cambosis. It's about the belts. He he beat the man for undisputed. He took the undisputed titles from the guy and then defended them. If Crawford had done what I felt he should have done, which is when he beat Spence to win the belts and then Boots called him out straight away, if Crawford said, yeah, sure, I'll fight you right now. I need to stay busy. Spence is doing whatever. Talk to the IBF, says, I'm going to fight Boots right now, but I have to still fight Spence sometime later. It would have been fine. He fights Boots. He's able to beat Boots. Okay, now he's up there. Let's say that he doesn't fight Boots right away. Gets stripped on the IBF. Boots says, come get your belt back. Crawford says, okay, sure. He goes. He beats Boots, takes the belt back, becomes two times undisputed at welterweight. Now, there's no case where you could not have Crawford as fighter of the year because he would have done something that no other fighter ever had. But Crawford refused. He beat Spence, sits on the belts, makes excuses, whines about being fighter of the year without doing anything to actually back it up, gets called out by Boots twice, first before he got stripped, second after he got stripped, come get your belt back, and just ducks it and refuses and tries to call out super middleweights in Canelo knowing damn well he's not going to be A-side, and Crawford has historically said he is not going to accept terms he doesn't like. He's not going to accept B-side. This is Canelo. Canelo is the A-side. Canelo's not going to accept any terms that are not his terms. That means his weight, his game. But Crawford, we know, is not going to accept that. So that means the fight was never going to happen. That means he was wasting people's time. And his fans are not calling him out on his bullshit. That's why Crawford was never going to be deserving of fighter of the year because he wasn't willing to do what would make him easily fighter of the year, which would have been to fight Boots Ennis. So I had already scratched him off the list that left Devin Haney or Nalia Inoue. I didn't care who got it. Either guy was well-deserving. 
I'm kudos to Inouye for that uh, accolade. I think it's huge. And we have to wait and see Crawford come out and start whining about it. But I want his fans to call him out on his bullshit. He's he's bullshitting you is what he's doing because he's talking this game. Everybody's talking about he's supposed to fight Smith. Do, do, do. Yeah, supposed to. What happened? That was supposed to be December. It didn't happen. Meanwhile, he's sitting on the titles. Meanwhile, he's not defending. He's getting stripped. He's sitting there whining about being fighter of the year. You can't give a guy fighter of the year for beating one guy. I'm sorry. That's not the way it works. When you got other guys who are stepping up, making history multiple times over. Devin Haney made history multiple fucking times over. And Noe made history multiple fucking times over. Spence has made history this one time now. I'm talking at 147 because that's where he's staying. If he's going to move to 154, fine. Then vacate the titles. He didn't want to do that either. He's not staying active enough. And if he's inactive for too damn long, it's going to be to his detriment. If you're really his fan, you would call that bullshit out. If you're not his fan, that's cool. And the reason I'm so adamant about this is Virgil Ortiz calling Crawford out for a 154. Sure, I'd be fine seeing that fight. I don't want Virgil calling Crawford out for it because Virgil needs to rebuild. I'm saying if Crawford had moved up to 154, that means he should ideally vacate the 147 so that 147, they can fight amongst each other. We can crown some new fucking stars instead of a guy sitting here whining about being fighter of the year without doing shit to prove it. And I don't want Virgil calling it out. I want Crawford pushing for it. Either you push and fight Boots right now at 147, or you vacate and push to 154, and you make a name to build towards a Virgil Ortiz fight, or a Jamel Charlotte fight, or a Tessera fight, or whatever the F. I don't care. Tim Zhu, I don't care. Do something. Poking with the stick. Do something, mf -er. Okay? That's what I want. So, that's our boxing. I'm probably not going to catch these events, unfortunately, because they're booked at 10 p.m. my time, and I'm not doing it at 10 p.m. Yes, I do have the zone, so maybe I can watch it after the fact if they do the replay. I don't think these are on the pay-per-view side. I think they're the regular stream. Uh, so if they are regular stream and they're played after the fact, then I'll check them after the fact, and then maybe I'll follow up based on what I see of Ortiz and Lawson. And again, I want Virgil to stop calling out Crawford for right now. Focus on rebuilding. Do what you got to do. Crawford's not moving up. He's holding it hostage. Let's see what he does first. If he decides to move up, then we can start talking about what that fight might do. Then our next week, we've got Arthur Bethlehem fighting uh, Callum Smith for the light heavyweight title. Uh, titles, IBF, WBC, WBO, that's a huge fight. Uh, Natasha Jonas and uh, Michaela Mayer, huge fight. Uh, Artem Delakian makes his return, finally. He's been out for a while. Can't wait to see that one. 23rd, Kenshiro Taraji's coming back. That's an amazing one. So we got some good fights coming up through January. And I think there's a couple that are scheduled to be booked. There was an announcement about Joshua Nagano. I think that would happen later on in like March or something. So we got some good fights coming. I'll check in after this uh, weekend's fights.